49, I want to kind of pick up where I left off this morning. A couple of weeks ago, I began the teaching on the 12 gates of the heart. And then uh, last Sunday, we took a little bit of a different direction and dealt with the uh, trumpets of the Lord and the process by which a ram's horn is converted to that of a beautiful musical instrument. Uh, basically, 14 steps involved in that. Um, you see, are all of these different steps and illustrations and teachings important? Oh, yeah, otherwise God wouldn't give them to us. Matter of fact, the word of God is eternal. Uh, I really do believe that the words of this book from Genesis to Revelation will be memorialized throughout eternity. For in other words, it's, it's, Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall never pass away. And, uh, of course, the minute we see him, we'll be like him, so all of the, the truth will be permanently and eternally burned into our hearts, you might say. Uh, it's almost like the imprint on a coin, and it's going to be there forever, and it will rule and reign over our lives. But when, uh, when the devil came to the woman and deceived her, he began to bombard her gates to her heart. Jesus talked about, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So there's gateways into the human heart. Now, I, I cannot imagine what it be like to have those gates permanently barred. What I mean by that, can you imagine if you were born blind or you lost your physical sight? That's a, that's a gateway into the heart. It'd be terrible. People live like that. They have no choice. Or what if your hearing gate was permanently gone? You couldn't hear, hear music, you couldn't communicate, you couldn't, uh, couldn't hear the birds singing, couldn't hear the voice of your wonderful uh, uh, mate or your children. And so, but these are gates. And the, the devil came to the woman, and because she didn't protect her gates, the enemy came in like a gangbuster. Now, really, the devil can't make you do anything. People say, the devil made me do it. Well, he can't make you do anything. But when man committed sin, uh, the enemy took over the gates of his life. Now, that doesn't mean that men have no control over themselves. It just means that, uh, you know, I, I quoted that scripture this morning in Ephesians chapter 2. And you had he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, were in time past. You walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So there is an enemy at work. He knows if he can capture our gates that he's got our life. So whatever our heart is full of, because out of the abundance of heart, the mouth speaketh. So sometimes when people get aggravated, they say things they shouldn't say. And, and then they say this, well, I didn't really mean it. Well, where did it come from? Somehow it came into your life. And we were talking about how you got to take back these gates. And the five senses, that's five gates, touch, taste, see, smell, and hear. And then you've got uh, the other gates, the other seven gates, uh, your emotions, your thoughts, your imaginations, your will. That means your motive, your purpose, your reason for living, the, the agenda that you've established for your life. Your mouth is a gate. That's why it says in Psalms 141, verse 3, Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. Uh, Eleven is your deeds. Now, I, I, there's a lot of wrong teaching today. People say, well, it doesn't really matter what you do because we're saved by grace. So first of all, they don't understand what grace is. They, they misunderstood the word grace for uh, mercy. We're, we're uh, saved by grace. Grace means the divine ability of God at work in you, quickened by the Holy Spirit. Actually, God's word, when it's hid in your heart, meditated upon, thought upon, um, sung, taught, uh, lived out, would be quickened by the Spirit, and that produces grace. Uh, that the grace of God might increase through the knowledge and the wisdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace increases through the knowledge of the truth. Uh, that's why people really should study John 14, 15, 16, and 17, because in those chapters, Christ begins to reveal such profound statements. And in John 8, Jesus is speaking to the Jewish people who believed on him, and he says, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. 
Now, of course, they're thinking about natural life, uh, breathing, heart beating, but he was talking about Zoe life. You, you don't have the life of God. Uh, you don't have the nature of God. You don't have the character of God. You don't have the attitude of God. So these are gates that we got to take possession of. And if the enemy can control any of these gates in your life. Now, like I said this morning, uh, the promised land, and that's another study. I did a teaching on it many years ago. We need to go over that teaching, probably turn it into a book. Every work of the, uh, all of the enemies in the land of Canaan, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Malachites, I, I can't remember how many there was. There was quite a number. Every one of them, if you look it up in the Hebrew, is the name of the work of the flesh. So they had to go in and take the land that God had given them. Now, it was theirs. Say, it was, it's ours. It's ours, but you got to take it. So scripturally, biblically, though, when you're born again, you're seated in heavenly places. All, all the blessings of heaven are yours. You're a, you're, you inherit all that God has for you. You're an heir, joint heir. But there is an enemy who uh, doesn't want to let go of what God has a right to control. You say, well, now, when I give my heart to Christ, I belong to God, right? Yes, absolutely right. It says, know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, uh, which is of God's. So when I say, Jesus, I surrender, I submit, I yield, I believe, you rose again from the dead, I repent of my sins, come into my heart, I belong to God. Well, now, if I belong to God, why doesn't God come in like a, 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 a gangbuster and just rip all? Wouldn't that be wonderful? Just rip the animal away from every one of our gates, out of our eyes, out of our appetite. Think about how people are in America today. I don't know if you know it, but over, I think it's close to 70% of all Americans are considered obese, something like that. It's just incredible, obese, overweight. You know what it is? And, and the shame about it is us preachers. Now, I realize that probably a lot of it is the food we eat. Like my son Daniel and I, we went down to South America to a little country called us, uh, what was the name? Suriname. And, we, and they fed us day to night. We couldn't hardly stand it. You know, we lost weight while we were down there. Now, how can you be fed morning to night and lose weight? It's the kind of food they were feeding us. It wasn't all this chemical stuff mixed in with it. It was just right out of the farmer's field, which they probably didn't use any kind of modern fertilizer. And so it was amazing. So I know there's stuff in America. Well, a good friend of mine, they put on some kind of medication, and he, he gained almost 100 pounds overnight with water weight. Boom. Bloated up. He went back to the doctor and said, Doc, something's wrong. Well, yeah, that's a side effect of that medication. Uh, you get water weight. <laughs> So it's crazy. I mean, people, you know what's really amazing to me is why people subject themselves to um, Smith Wigglesworth in the 1940s, called him quacks. He called him quacks. I'm sorry. If you're a medical doctor, you're most likely a quack. I'm sorry. That's all there is to it. I don't mean a duck either. I mean, you're goofy. Something's wrong in your head. But the truth of the matter is, is that we need to bring every gate under control of the authority of Jesus Christ. Then Jesus said to the disciples, he said, whom do you say that I am? And Peter spoke up and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said a very profound thing. He said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my father which is in heaven. Now remember, what the father revealed to him was who Christ was. We, we, we really, people say they know who Christ is, but do we really? It's a revelation. <gasps> He's my healer. He's my protector. He's my provider. He's my shepherd. He's my Lord. He's my king. He's my God. He's my help in the time of trouble. He's my high tower I run into in the time of trouble. He's my psychiatrist. He's my everything. You get a revelation of who Jesus is, and all of a sudden you take that revelation and you begin to tell the devil to let go. He said, no, no, you let go of my taste buds. Um, you know, one time, I'll be honest with you, um, I was addicted to strong alcohol, uh, southern comfort, vodka, stuff like that. 
I was addicted to cigarettes. I was addicted to chewing tobacco. I was, I was addicted to almost everything that's bad for you. Guess what, though? I took control over that gate in the name of Jesus. So Jesus said that upon this reality of who I am, that the Father has revealed me to you, I will build my kingdom, listen, and the gates of hell will not prevail against me. That means, remember the time that, that, and he blew it, Samson went into one of the city of the Philistines, got drunk, did things he shouldn't have done. They said, bar the gates, keep them locked up like a captive in a cage. Bar the gates. You know what Samson did? He went over and grabbed those, and they weren't no little gates. There, there's not like a yard gate that your, keeps your dog in the house, you know. It, he went over there and grabbed those gates, ripped them off the hinges, and carried them away to the top of the hill. He, by the power of God, now remember, how did Samson do that? By the Spirit of God. He could have never done it himself. How do we get back possession of our gates? Now, most people don't even know that their gates are under the influence of demonic powers. We're talking born-again, spirit-filled, tongue-talking Christians. Their gates are under the control of demonic powers. You, you know, how do you know that? Look what they do. Look what they watch. Listen to what they say. They say completely that which is contrary to the will of God. Their will, their purpose for living. I mean, if the devil gets your motive and your purpose, if he, if he, if he gets a hold of your, uh, 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 the, the, the um, part of you that... Uh, uh, um, you know, it's, it's, it's your agenda, you're a goner. I mean, that's what happened to David, King David. I mean, King David overcame the enemy again and again and again, more times than we, we'd like to talk about. But somehow the devil got his eye gate, and then his agenda changed. And he got to thinking, I want her. And then when he got her, she got pregnant. He said, I've got to cover this deed. I've got to cover this this wicked act. I can't let him. And he, ha he plotted to have Uriah and had him murdered. Really, left him out there to be, for, to be slaughtered by the enemy. And God said, you didn't get away with it. The enemy is in the camp. Somehow, remember when Joshua and all the children of Israel were so victorious, they marched around Jericho. The wall fell down. And people say, well, it doesn't matter what I do. God loves me. There's consequences. He said, now do not take any Thing out of that city. It's all, it's all wicked in my eyes. It's all contaminated. Well, I don't understand, God. What's the difference between a piece of gold, a gold piece of gold or a piece of garment that's in the city compared to those on a... Because there was other places he let him take all the gold and all the garments. Why would God do that? Every time he would have them take a city, he'd give them different instructions. You know what it was all about? Obedience. You know, my dad used to say... Um, just do what I tell you, son. Now, he also said, don't, don't look at what I do, do what I tell you. And we know that doesn't work. But Christ was the perfect illustration of perfect obedience to the will of the Father. So even though Jesus was tempted in every way as we are, he was without disobedience, without willful sin. The enemy bombarded the 12 gates going into the heart of Jesus, who is the real you. Your heart is the real you. Now, I, I'm putting out a book, Lord willing. I'm doing a series of books called The Mysteries of the Kingdom, and I'm going to do a book, Lord willing, called The Triunity of Man. Because a lot of people are all messed up when it comes to the triunity of man. You say, does it really matter? It makes a big difference. A lot of people think that the part of you that gets born again when you, get, when you give your heart to Christ is your spirit. No, it's not your spirit. It's your soul. Your heart gets born again. I will give you a new heart. And when he says, I'll put a new spirit in you, it means, uh, see, the word spirit is really mysterious because it's used in many connotations. And many times uh, it, it said Caleb and Joshua had a different spirit. If you study, it means an attitude. Remember, the attitude is a gate, a victorious attitude, a faithful attitude. See, all of these gates can be filled with faith. I know that sounds impossible, 
But when your heart is full of faith, your mouth will be full of faith. Your actions, your works are a gate. It'll be full of faith. Your, uh, your, 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 everything you do will be filled with faith. You take a look at David. I mean, not David, but Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, they, even though they lived in, a, in, in, in uh, Jerusalem where it was this filled, and Jeremiah warned them for 40 years, filled and filled with wickedness to such a place where God finally had to send Nebuchadnezzar, a king more wicked than them, to bring destruction. Well, how did Nebuchadnezzar, why did God let Nebuchadnezzar come in and destroy the Israelites? Because the Israelites flood, they flung their gates open to perversion. See, they were supposed to be gates of righteousness. My, 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 it says, by their fruits you'll know them. My, my, and matter of fact, in the book of Revelation, you'll be amazed that it never talks about grace, doesn't talk about mercy, it talks about works. The very first, uh, uh, the church is, I know thy works, I know thy works, I know, because your works can only manifest what is in your heart. And if, if your works uh, are contrary to the will of God, that means the enemy's got a hold of you. So the works of the Israelites, they flung their gates wide open to uh, worshiping of idols. Uh, you name it, they were doing it, even in the house of God. And God kept warning them. Isn't it wonderful that God doesn't give us one, two, or three warnings? He'll warn us and warn us and warn us and warn us and warn us. I, I tell you what, it's a frightening thing. There's times when I had a prophetic word. I remember years and years ago, I had a young evangelist in our church. He was kind of tall, husky. He was probably in his late 20s. And uh, I'm going down a line, and the Spirit of God is really moving that morning. I'm giving people prophetic words, not pathetic words, prophetic words. I come to him. I don't have a word for him at the time. I laid my hands on him, and the power of God hit him. I don't push people down. And actually, I tell people, if he can stand up, stand up. And sometimes I help people stand up, but he... Boom, down he went. It was right over in this section. I go down a little bit. I'm so deep in the spirit. Next thing I know, I find myself back over the top of him, and I pick him up by his, I am not exact, everybody saw it. Picked him up, and I slapped him as hard as, I'm in the spirit, man. I slapped him in the face. Boom. And on the way back, I slapped him again. Boom. And I must have done it about five or six times. Whack, whack. I'm just going at it, man. Slapping him in the face. I'm gone. I'm, I'm like drunk in the spirit. I walk away and I go down. I get about three people down and, and the Lord brings me right back. I stand over the top of them and I give them a very precise prophetic word in front of everybody. And I said to them, and I can't give you that. Thou saith the Lord. He said, unless you beat your body into submission, even as my servant has slapped your face, you will become a reprobate and an outlaw. Wow. I didn't even think about it at the time. After this service, I thought, what in the world was that? That same week, later on, we had a young lady in our church by the name of Kim. We had two ladies in our church by the name of Kim, both in their early 20s. Um, the one young lady had, was a, a, a virgin unto God. The mother of that young lady who was a virgin unto God, she caused me up crying. Pastor Mike, Pastor Mike, Pastor Mike. I said, what's wrong, sister? Oh, my daughter's run off with evangelist so-and-so. I said, what? Well, not only did he run off with her, but it turns out he's been having a relationship with the other Kim. I said, oh, Father, that's what that was all about. And then she called me back a couple weeks later. She says, Pastor Mike, pray. He's beating my daughter He's abusing my daughter. They're up north somewhere, and he's getting drunk, and he's wild. Well, a couple of weeks when I got went by, she called him and said, Oh, Pastor Mike, you can't believe what happened. I said, What? They got pulled over by the police. He got in a physical fight with the cop and took the gun away from the cop. He's a fugitive of the law. That's what it was, a fugitive. But see, God gave him warnings, didn't he? God told him, uh, tragedies in my life, God has warned me, God has told me. And I wish I could tell you that 
I always listened, <laughs> but I did. And God would tell me, this is what's going to happen if you do this and this and this. And I just wouldn't listen. You know, because that's, the, and, and why won't we listen? Because the enemy's got our gate. Our mind, our thoughts, our emotions, our attitude, our purpose, uh, our mouth, our mouth. Um, so, but here in, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 49, verse 24, shall the prey be taken from the mighty or the lawful captive delivered? But thus saith the Lord, even the captive of the mighty shall be taken away, and the prey of the terrible shall be delivered. For I will contend with him that contendeth with thee, and I will save thy children. God said, I'm going to send you a deliverer. And if you looked in verse 8, you can read on down when you got a time. Verse 8 of this, he begins to talk to you about, and really he's talking about Jesus. I will have a covenant with this man. Uh, there's another scripture that says uh, that he will be my firstborn, uh, raised from the dead, and my covenant shall stand fast with him. And it's all about Jesus Christ. You know, when Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me. And he's talking about setting the captives free. So we, we basically have been the captives. I mean, the, 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 because of what Adam and his wife did in the garden, we became, to some extent, the, uh, I'll say, the playthings of the devil. Messing with our mind, messing with our attitudes. You know, people who are tormented, they love to torment. Now, I, I, I don't... I don't like this story, but it's really what happened to me as a young boy. I was so tormented as a young kid. I mean, as a, as a young kid, six, seven years old. And I don't, I don't even like this story, but we had two beetle, be, uh, little beagles that my dad would use for hunting. We also had an older beagle called Kipper. But we had peanuts and cuddles. And when nobody was around, I would choke those dogs until they were almost dead. And then I'd take my hands off of their throats, and I'd be weeping and crying, and I'd be hugging them, and I'd be telling them, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, and then I would do it again. What was that about, demonic? As a kid, you say, did you have a devil, Pastor Mike? I, I don't know if I had a devil, but I had devils tormenting me. I didn't know the truth. See, raise up a child in the way they should go. That's another reason why parents need to raise their children with the word of God. How are you going to fight off evil powers without a spiritual weapon? See, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God. To what? To the pulling down of strongholds. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself above the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity what? Every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now, we've never lived in a generation where our minds can be so bombarded by lies. By lies. Lies of the devil. I mean, I've been fighting against this lie since I've been saved that God makes people sick to teach them things. What a lie. My children were never raised that with that lie. My children were never raised with the lie of Santa Claus or the Easter Bunny, you know. You say, well, does that, all of that stuff has an effect on children's lives. Um, I remember I tell the story, I, I completely believed in the fat man and the white and the reindeer and everything. I believed in it. My, my older brother, he would go out in the yard and, and, and make tracks in the snow, if we had snow in Wisconsin, and he'd wake me up, hey, Santa Claus has been here. Santa, I'm so excited. I, must, I don't know how long I believed in him, maybe until I was 10 years old. It was ridiculous. I mean, I'd be excited. And one day somebody told me that he was fake. He was make-believe. I am not, I can remember going and hiding and just weeping till I couldn't weep anymore that this fat man, this fat man in, in red clothing who had reindeer that delivered gifts every Christmas Eve was not real. You, you, you know, we do a very, we do a, we do a disservice. We, we, uh, we as parents sometimes set our kids up for destruction. You, you got to raise your children in the truth. You got to raise them. You, you got to find ways to feed them the truth. 
And there's all kinds of good programs out there. I know my, my family, my kids are really seriously talking about putting together some children's programs um, to try to teach. There are some good teachings out there. But there's a lot of garbage, too. And, and, and so how did the enemy get into the heart of man? Lies. Lies. How does the enemy get into our hearts? Lies. God doesn't love you. God won't forgive you. There ain't nothing you can do to cause God to punish you. I mean, these are all lies. These are strongholds. How do we overcome these strongholds? By the word of God. See, it's amazing. God leaves the Israelites in a wilderness for 40 years that they could learn one simple truth, one truth. They're out there in the heat. They're out there where the snakes are, no water, no food. God's got to provide from heaven, water from the rock. God's got to protect them. One truth they were supposed to learn. One truth. What was it? Man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Now, you can't make people learn that lesson. You've got to learn it for yourself. I've got to live by the word. It is written. It is written. It is written. How am I going to take back the gates? It is written. It is written. It is written. Well, what if the enemy gets your gate? What well, just don't, just don't let them keep it then. If the enemy gets, have you ever, since you've been saved, probably not, but have any of you ever got a bad attitude since you've been saved? What do you do? you got to take back that gate and say, oh, man, I'm supposed to be kind and forgiving and gentle and merciful and loving and compassionate and forgiving. Okay, somehow I got bitterness in my heart. It came through one of the, it came through my ear gate, my eye gate, my whatever gate. It came through my attitude gate. It came through my, 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 my thinking. Okay, I've got to take back that gate. Because if I don't, if I let the devil keep that gate, I'm a goner. Matter of fact, that's why he says, take heed lest a root of bitterness spring up in you and many be defiled. I, I, I can tell you honestly, uh, I, knew, I knew we had some good people in here and somehow they got bitter. A seed of bit, and the devil planted it. They let the devil plant it. A seed of bitterness got in them and it spread through the whole body. True story. One, my, my wife was over uh, the children's ministry, and we had a preacher's son who played the drums and worked in our children's church. And one Sunday morning, she had a Sunday school meeting with all the teachers. Back in them days, we were, you know, pretty large. You know, I'd say at that time, over 150 maybe. And she had a meeting with these teachers. And this young guy, he was a nice guy. He kept speaking out of time. He was probably in his 20s. My wife was probably uh, late 20s, and she shouldn't have done it. She didn't hand, basically said, shh, be quiet, sit down. No, he'd been a pastor's son all of his life. He got highly offended, highly, right then and there. He let the enemy come in and plant a seed of bitterness in his heart. So I still remember that morning. I am preaching about Absalom. How many know who Absalom is? Absalom was the son of David. And David's the king, and Absalom was meeting people at the gate every day and telling them whatever they want to hear and trying to convince them that David, uh, he knew was David was going to make Solomon his, 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 uh, his, the, king, the next king, so he plotted to take over the kingdom while David's still in, and he got the hearts of the people. And, of course, it didn't work. Absalom got hung by his beautiful hair in the tree, and Joab, I think it was, killed him. So, but... As I'm preaching, this young son of a pastor, I'm watching him go from talking to people. Now, I also had a backslidden preacher with me that had come back to the Lord. We had won him back to the Lord. He was getting on fire uh, with God. He's talking to him. And after the church, all hell broke loose. I mean, like it hit the fan. And I lost over 30 people that morning, over 30 and it, rep, it rippled through the whole congregation. And I lost that pastor, that, ex, that man of God who had just come back to the Lord. Now, 
that, that man did call back, call me back about 10 years later. And, and, and thank God he apologized. He said, Pastor Mike, this is brother so-and-so. Uh, and, and I'm so sorry I did what I did. Could you forgive me? I said, brother, I, I, I forgave you right away because I can't let that in my heart. But he hurt a lot of people because he let the devil take, somehow get into his heart through one of the gates. He didn't like what he heard. He didn't like what he saw. His mind, he didn't have his mind under the control of the word. You, 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 this is very serious stuff. So God spoke to Jeremiah. Look there in Jeremiah before we close tonight. Jeremiah. And, and I am taking my time with this particular subject because people really need to understand the importance of possessing their gates because um, they're going to lose their souls. You lose your soul. You, you don't claim your gates. You can, you'll, you'll lose your soul. You know, it says, that, Now they that do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. The works of the flesh shall manifest which are these, adultery, fornication, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. And they that do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's Galatians chapter 5. Them, them are all activities of the flesh that come through the gates into your heart. It says that you're supposed to guard your heart with all diligence, protect your heart, for out of it flows the issues of life. Why did God choose David and get rid of King Saul or take away his position? Because he said, I'm looking for a man after my own heart. So David protected his heart. Of course, later on he messed up, but he did get right again. That, that's the wonderful news. I'm not encouraging anybody to mess up. Because once you mess up, you're never the same. After David messed up, it affected his whole family. It rippled down through the generations. It really did. But David was never the same man after that. And um, I'm telling you, man, it, it's, it's dangerous stuff we're dealing here with. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet to the nations. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. Listen, but the Lord said unto him, Say not, I am a child. Because Jeremiah, without realizing it, the enemy had already had control of some of his gates. He's looking at his youth. He's looking at his inability. You understand, everything that God calls us to do, most likely God will call you to do something that you have no ability to do. You realize when, I, when, when um, I gave my heart to Christ, I knew right then and there, God had called me to preach. There, there's only some major problems here. I've never known a preacher in our family. I've never known a public speaker in our family. I quit school at 15. I had major hearing problems, and I had a major speech impediment. I'm telling you, it was so bad, you could not really understand what I said. And after I got baptized in the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues, and God gave me the ability to speak, I was back home in McQuanago, Wisconsin, and talking to one of my neighbors one day, Mrs. Markison, Betsy, and she spoke up and said, Mike, what happened to you? Now, she had been, known me my, my, ever since I was a little kid. I said, well, I gave my heart to Jesus. She said, no, for the first time, I can understand what you're saying. Uh... But when God called me to preach, knowing I had a speech impediment, hearing problems, quit school at 15, never been a public speaker, I, I'm honestly telling you, not one time did I argue with him. I don't know why. I just said, I said, okay, God. <laughs> okay. You want me to preach? Okay. And I did with my garbled speech until a couple of weeks later, I got baptized in the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues. And then when my tongue got loosed, I really took off. <laughs> and I've never shut up. But Jeremiah said, I can't do this. He said, don't say that. Don't let the devil have your mouth gate. Remember the Israelites said, we can't take the land. God got upset with him. God even said to Moses, get out of the way. I'll just take them all out. That's what God said. Moses said, no, Lord, don't. Just don't do it, Lord. So 
But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child. Don't say you can't do the will of God. For thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. And then he says this, Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Now, what God is doing at that moment, he is supernaturally equipping Jeremiah to overcome. How? With the truth. Here's the truth, Jeremiah. You'll preach what I tell you to preach. You'll go where I tell you to go, and you'll do what I tell you to do. And Jeremiah did not argue with God. Just like that, boom, the devil's kicked out of his gates. He's taken back possession of the gates. Be not afraid. You know, God hasn't given us a spirit of fear. Verse 9, then the Lord put his hand, look it, then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. He gave him the word, now he's touching his mouth. Say, Lord, touch my mouth. You know, that's in, in uh, James, it says, Be not known many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For if any man offend not with his mouth, he is a perfect man and able also to brighter the whole body. Wow. You get control of your mouth, you can bridle your whole body. I, I cannot tell you how many times where everything in my body, my mind, my emotions contradicted God's word. But I've learned through the years, don't agree with the enemy. Do not agree with the enemy. So I don't agree with him. Uh, when it looked like I had prostate cancer, I didn't tell anybody. It looked like I had colon cancer, didn't tell anybody. When I had a hernia, only my wife knew about it. You know, a lot of people don't realize it. And I understand they're trying to get sympathy they're trying to make people feel sorry for them. And they say, well, pray for me. I'm going through this and this and this. Hey, there's a lot of church services. They said, now, does anybody have a prayer request? And they'll stand up and give 15 minutes of praise to the devil. Well, I don't do that. Jesus never asked anybody their problem. He never did. What's your problem, boy? Never said it. Oh, you poor thing. What's wrong? Never. He, he said this. What do you want me to do for you. That's what he said. What do you want me to do for you? Okay, let's do it. So, then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. Where? In your mouth. Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. What did he tell Jeremiah? He said, uh, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate there in day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of good courage, be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, wheresoever thou goest. So a lot of people don't realize gasoline is no good until you get it into the engine. You got to get it coming out of your mouth. That's the key. That's what meditation, it means to mutter, to speak. Speak into, be filled with the Spirit. How? Speaking to yourselves. Now, when I preach to you, it edifies me. But I tell you what, I spend way more time speaking to Mike Yeager, quoting the word over my life, than I do preaching. A lot more. And I don't just read it, I speak it. Something happens. It's a supernatural thing. It says, the angels of God hearkened to the voice of God's word. Angels don't hearken to my thoughts. I mean, thinking good thoughts doesn't bring angels. Speaking the word, God, you meet my needs. You said you'd never leave me nor forsake me. 
You said if I call out to you, you would answer me and show me great and mighty things which I knew was not. He said, My son, attend to my words, incline thy ear unto my sayings, let them not depart from thine eyes, keep them in the midst of thine heart, for they are life, they are life unto those that find them, and health to all their flesh. Wow. If we'd only get a revelation of the power of God's word hidden in our hearts, smoke, spoken out of our mouth. Now, what's going to happen? Because we're talking back, taking back my gates. I've got to take my eye gates, my ear gates. Now, when I talk about taking my ear gates, what I'm talking about is the fact that when I got born again, I, right then and there, right then and there, I just, I knew. I mean, I, I like music. I like worldly music before I got saved. And I like basically, you know, Pink Floyd and... Dr. Hook and the Medicine Band and the Grateful Dead and this kind of filth. And I'm telling you, the very minute when I gave my heart to Christ, I went and gra ga gathered all my music, worldly music, and I threw it away. Boom. Trashed it. I went down to the local, because on a military base they sell music, and the only thing I could find, I still remember it, the only Christian thing I could find in album you all know what albums are, right? <laughs> and uh, then they had the big eight-track players, and then they had the cassettes, and now they had CDs, and now they got thumb drives. But I w the only thing I could find was the singing nun. And I would sit back and listen to the singing nun, <laughs> and I would cry, <laughs> you know? That's the only thing I could, but I was filling my gate, my ear gate, with godly music, godly music. It says, see, I have this day set thee over the nations. I put my words in your mouth. I put you over the nations and over the kingdoms to, listen, six things. To root out, to pull down, to destroy, to throw down. Why? To build and to plant. So what we're talking about here is a radical deconstruction for a reconstruction. To renovate, most times when they renovate a building, you got to tear a bunch of stuff out. Um, I just read the other day about somebody who was in an old car they got, and they stripped it all the way down to every bolt, every nut, every screw, everything, and they started from the frame up and rebuilt that puppy to where it was like brand new. Now, why would they do that? Why didn't they just... Why did they worry about the frame? No, they wanted to restore it back to its original condition. Man originally was walking with God. So God wants to restore us. So he puts a new spirit in us, a spirit of cooperation. And we go, yes, God, your will. And then he begins to pull down, root out, cast down, throw down. To How? With the word. Remember, it was the word in his mouth. Say the word in my mouth. And then he began to build. Began to plant and grow and build. Began to do, began to do progressive work. I, I don't know if you know much about this. I don't know. I'd like to study it some more. These, uh, these uh, uh, tall skyscrapers that reach into the heavens. You can't believe how deep some of them go. In order to hold that structure up, you know, it's like a tree. You know, sometimes you see trees falling over in a windstorm, and that's because that means their root system wasn't very deep. You know, the higher a tree goes, the deeper the roots have got to be. And actually, you'll see trees standing on the side of a mountain that will last longer than trees in a swampy area. Because trees in a wet area, their roots don't have to go deep because they got all the water you could want, but when the strong winds come, it just, boom, they fall over. Uh, there's a lot of people... They can't handle a lot of trials, a lot of pressure. Uh, I really, you know, I think it's this generation. We have a generation that they're, they're I call them thumb-sucking, diaper-filling babies. Uh, they just can't handle a little bit of pressure, a little bit of problems, a little bit of hardship. Uh, I'm talking about even in a secular world. I remember my mom. My mom went through hell with my dad. My dad didn't know God. He was a gambler, alcoholic. He was smart, had a good job. We never saw the results of the money. I never knew where the money went. My mom worked two jobs. We never had enough money. Um, my dad abused her and abused her and abused her, but my mom stuck. Nobody made my mom stick with him. My mom just had this tenacity 
of never quitting. And finally, he left her, broke her heart, really. And she's been gone for since 2000. But my mom would just, I always thought, my, my dad was my hero before I got saved. When I got saved, my mom became my hero. I saw the truth. I saw the truth. I said, what a woman. And I abused her as a kid, yelling at her, screaming at her, disrespectful. Now, if my dad caught me, he'd smack me good, you know. But I did it when he wasn't around. Just a little lady, five foot four, maybe. I remember one time, I just was being a, a little stinker. I was probably 15, 16. She grabbed that old frying pan, and she smacked me with it. And she said, hey, you may be bigger than me, but I'll put you in place, you know. But she had this tenacity of, I'm not giving up on this marriage. Faith with patience. Longevity, inherit the promises. So why would God have you in this place, Pastor Mike, since 1983, when so many times it doesn't seem like anything is happening? I, I, I really do believe that God's he's making me to dig my roots deep and live by not how it looks, just to be obedient. We'll close with this. There was a guy by the name of William Carey. He went to India. You have to get the exact uh, correct information. I might get a little bit misconstrued, but he was, a, he was a missionary. And he went to India, and he worked and worked and worked to try to get people saved. It's just the Buddhists and the Hindus and all of the face, fake religions had such a stronghold in the minds and the hearts of those people, he couldn't get nowhere. Finally, after laboring, laboring for many, many years, he finally gets one convert. And, um, and then he gets another convert. And in just a matter of a couple of years, like the floodgates open up and boom, 200, 200. And then he up and dies. But after he dies, they said literally revival hit and hundreds of thousands came in. Now, after all of those years of laboring, because it didn't look like it was producing, you know, Many, many years, look him up. He could have just said, I must be out of God's will. I'm out of here. I'll go somewhere where it's easy, easy picking. And there are places like that. There's places that it's easy to win people to Christ. Now, whether or not they stay committed, I don't know. But in that nation, he'd give an honor call, and, of course, they'd kill you. I mean, the Hindus will kill you, man. They'll stone you. I mean, some, these religions are violent. Almost all religions are. And true Christianity, the only thing we're violent with is the devil. But, um, but uh, he didn't give up. He said, I'm, I'm, and he went there to pull down the strongholds of the devil. Amen. So, Father, we thank you for the truth. We thank you that we're taking back possession of our gates. Lord, we're not going to let the enemy inhabit our gates. You said the gates of hell would not prevail against the revelation of Christ. And, Father, we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Everybody says, Amen. Amen. So you can start recording. So we, we got a we can we can't.